Hello and welcome back. As a reminder, my name is Eunice Mathis. I am the nurse educator with Florida Training Academy, and we are on our last 20 um, practice questions for this CNA, the nurse aid um, practice exam, the written examination. Um, if you have any questions about how many questions are on the exam or what time frame, go all the way back to the first video um, and or, um, yeah, just go back to the first video. <laughs> all right, so question number 31. A resident who is inactive is at risk of constipation. In addition to increased activity and exercise, which of the following actions help to prevent constipation? A, adequate fluid intake, B, regular meal times, C, high protein diet, D, low fiber diet. All right, so we're gonna have them up and moving That's peristalsis, that way we're gonna get the bowel to move, but we also need to give them some adequate fluid. So they're gonna need fluid and activity. Regular meal times doesn't necessarily promote um, um, regularity because we don't know what they're eating during those regular meal times. If they're just eating a high protein diet, such as what C is indicating, and they're not consuming any fiber, well, that's going to increase their chances of being constipated. The answer would not be D. A low fiber diet is not recommended. It's usually a high fiber diet. However, if you just give them fiber, fiber is going to bulk up all the fecal matter and you don't give them any water, it's gonna constipate them. So they're gonna need fiber and water in order to maintain a normal bowel pattern. 32, a resident has an indwelling urinary catheter. While making rounds, the nurse aide notices that there is no urine in the drainage bag. The nurse aide should first. All right, so indwelling means it's hanging around. It can be in place up to 30 days. Sometimes we'll put that in preoperatively. Um, that way when a person has anesthesia, they don't have to worry about, you know, any of the complications from retaining urine. And we may keep that in for a few days post-op. Sometimes the patient may have like a, a really bad bed sore. And if they have a bed sore, we cannot risk that bed sore continually getting wet because they're incontinent of, of urine. So we may put a urinary catheter in them, you know, also. But so this person has a tube in place that is draining their urine. And now you're checking the bag and there is no urine in the bag. What should you do? A, ask the resident to try urinating. B, offer the resident fluid to drink. C, check for kinks in the tubing. D, obtain a new urinary drainage bag. The answer is not A, um, because the urine should flow freely. Um, and usually they're going to produce about 30 to 60 mLs an hour, whether they drink anything or not, unless they're, you know, um, you know, in stage, unless they're actively dying. B, offer the resident fluids to drink. Well, that sounds like it would be a good answer. But again, it's going to take a while for that fluid to be processed and, you know, for it to be filtered by the kidneys um, and then end in the bladder where it can be drained out of the bag. So the best answer is going to be C. You want to check for kinks in the tubing. Your patients are Houdinis. Uh, they wrap the tubes around their legs or if a person's a, a, you know, heavier, they can actually, um, they can actually kink the tubing with their body weight. So you wanna make sure that the tubing's always free flowing, you know, not under the patient. They usually have some type of um, leg, um, a leg securing device that they'll use in order to make sure that the tube does not go under the patient. 33. A resident who is incontinent of urine has an increased risk of developing A, dementia, B, urinary tract infections, C, pressure sores, or D, dehydration. Most students select B. A resident who is incontinent of urine has an increased risk of developing UTIs. When someone is incontinent, it's not that they're not urinating. So it's not that they are not retaining urine. When someone is incontinent, they can't control the urine. Therefore, they are wet. And I know for this question, it didn't say anything about diaper rash. It went all the way to pressure sores. But whenever you have a, a patient who stays wet, well, we know the end result is going to be skin deterioration and worst case scenario, um, scenario of pressure sore. Um, and then also, if you go back to B, Usually if a person is sitting in their urine, urine is sterile until it's contaminated. What would contaminate urine? Fecal matter. So if someone is sitting in urine mixed with fecal matter or feces, that can enter the UTI or the urinary tract and give them a UTI. But for the best answer for these purposes, incontinence means they're unable to control their urine. So if, they're, if they can't control their urine, they're wet, the best answer is going to be C. 34, 
When cleansing the genital area during perineal care, the nurse aide should A, cleanse the penis with a circular motion starting from the base and moving towards the tip. Well, that's just taking germs from the base where the hair is and moving it toward the tip, the meatus, and, and that's the improper way to clean. B, replace the foreskin when pushed back to cleanse an uncir uncircumcised penis. Well, um, one of the um, problems with, with men who are uncircumcised is that the, the, the excess skin can house a whole bunch of um, you know, germs and bacteria. So whenever you're cleaning someone who has that extra skin on their penis, you do want to pull that skin back. And then you're going to wash the penis starting at the tip. Circular motions go all the way down. Um, and then when you get to the base of the penis and you're cleaning the hairy area, of course, you know, switch places on the washcloth if you need to. But whenever you start cleaning the male's testicles, make sure you lift them and clean beneath the testicles too. And now you're going to rinse in the same direction and then you're going to dry. Whenever you get through, you want to pull that foreskin back up on the penis um, in order to prevent a painful condition that the man can have if blood gets trapped and that excess skin forms like a tourniquet. So if you pull the skin back, please be sure to replace it. C is not the correct answer. You would never clean the rectal area first before cleansing the genital area. If you're going to clean, you're going to start from the, the least contaminated to the most contaminated. So it's front to back. D, use the same area on the washcloth for each washing and rinsing stroke for a female resident. Every time you wash a female, I want you to pretend that she is either on her menstrual, uh, her menses, she's on a menstrual cycle, or um, that she has fecal matter. So that way, every time you wipe, just like with toilet paper, you're not going to use that same spot twice. You're going to keep changing spots on the washcloth. Otherwise, if this is the vaginal area and this is the rectal area, when you wipe and you don't change spots, you're going to recontaminate that patient and put fecal matter um, closer to the entrance of a urinary tract. We don't want that. So in short, the answer to 34 is going to be B as in boy. 35, which of the fawns consider a normal age-related change? Dementia, contractures, bladder holding less urine, wheezing when breathing. And we watch a lot of TV, so I'm sure a lot of you think that A is the correct answer, but dementia is not normal. <laughs> And dementia happens way down the line. So we talked about some of the normal age-related changes already in a previous video. Well, a resident could have visual changes. They can have, you know, difficulty hearing. Their skin could get thin. The muscles get weak. And we talked about the heart and the bladder being muscles. So if the, if the bladder gets weak, the answer is going to be C. The person's going to hold less urine. So that means that they're going to be more likely to be incontinent of urine. You have to take them to the bathroom more quickly. Um, the answer is not be a contracture, it's a fixed joint. That has to do with the lack of range of motion and nothing to do with the normal age, you know, related changes. 36. A resident is on a bladder retraining program. The nurse aide can expect the resident to, A, have a fluid intake restriction to prevent sudden urges to urinate, B, wear an incontinent brief in case of an accident, C, wear it have an indwelling urinary catheter or D, have a schedule for toileting. In most cases, um, with our patients, we want to do the least invasive technique. So we're going to do the least invasive and see if that works before we start going all the way to catheterizing someone just because they're wet. Um, you cannot do A. A doctor has to prescribe a fluid restriction. If you restrict your patient's fluids, that could be considered neglect. So you're not going to do A unless a doctor has ordered a fluid restriction. You can offer a patient an incontinent brief, but you cannot expect them to wear one. A lot of your patients will say, no, I'm not a baby. I'm not going to wear a diaper. Your job is to take them to the bathroom more frequently. So the answer is going to be D as in dog. And then it's not C, because anytime you place something foreign in a patient's body, um, one of the side effects or consequences could be an infection. So again, we're going to do the least invasive, you know, technique or skill first. And the least invasive is that if a person needs their bladder retrained, kind of like potty training, but we can't use that word for an adult, you're going to take them to the bathroom more frequently. 37, a resident who has stress incontinence, A, will have an indwelling urinary catheter, B, should wear an incontinent brief at night, C, may leak urine when laughing or coughing, D, needs toileting every one to two hours throughout the day. 
And the difference here is that they put the word stress in front of incontinence. So the way I want you to think about stress is pressure on top of the bladder. That happens a lot when someone is pregnant all the excess fluid from the baby and the baby weight, when it's sitting on a bladder, if that pregnant woman laughs or coughs, <laughs> she may leak out some urine. So the answer um, to the question 37 is going to be C. When someone has stress incontinence, maybe they have like a weak pelvic area, um, they're going to leak urine. And something that we advise, especially women who have had multiple um, vaginal births or vaginal deliveries, is that we'd ask them to do king. Kegel exercises to help tighten those muscles. 38, the doctor has told the resident that his cancer is growing and that he is dying. When the resident tells the nurse aide that there is a mistake, the nurse aide should A, understand that denial is a normal reaction. B, remind the resident that the doctor would not lie. C, suggest the resident ask for more tests. D, ask if the resident is afraid of dying. So the doctor said the cancer is growing. <laughs> so that kind of lets you know that there is a history where, you know, this is not the first time this patient has heard that they have cancer. So the best response, you know, to this is to refer them back to the nurse or just listen intently. But I need you to understand, A, that denial is a normal reaction, okay? Some people don't accept the fact that they have cancer. They never accept the fact. Some of them will, you know, still have their chemo and still be trying to smoke cigarettes. So um, just understand denial is normal. You don't want to tell someone that the doctor would not lie um, because doctors are human and some of them do not tell the truth all the time. Um, you can recommend that the person acts for more tests, but that would not be my first thought when I know that this person has a history of cancer. And again, the doctor has told the resident that his cancer is growing. So this is not a new diagnosis. Um, moving on to 39. A slip knot is used when securing a restraint so that A, the restraint cannot be removed easily by the resident. Um, B, so that the restraint can be removed quickly when needed. C, body alignment is maintained while wearing the restraint. Or D, it can be easily observed whether um, it can it can be easily observed whether the restraint is applied correctly. When you think of a slip knot, I want you to think of the way that you tie your tennis shoes, um, the laces on your shoes. Um, it usually has the two loops and the two strings, and that way if there's an emergency or if you want to take off your shoes, you just pull one string and then the entire lace, you know, they untie. That's how you want to secure your restraints. And your restraints are normally secured to the frame that the mattress sits on, not on the actual side rails. Because if you restrain somebody and you tie the restraints to the side rail, sometimes the side rails can collapse. And if they do, you can injure your person, your patient, or you can dislocate one of their joints. So the way that you're going to tie your restraint, if you have a restrained patient, is going to be B slip knot, the way that um, we tie our restraints so it can be removed quickly when needed. And that is something that most of your facilities will teach you if it's a facility that allows restraints. Not all facilities allow restraints. I apologize about that. 40, when using personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, the nurse A correctly fodder, follows standard, precaution, standard precautions when wearing A, double gloves when providing perineal care to a resident, B, a mask and gown while feeding a resident that coughs, C, gloves to remove a resident's bedpan, or D, gloves while ambulating a resident. And to me, there are, a lot of these answers sound correct. But um, you would not double glove. Double gloving is never a standard precaution. <laughs> One pair of gloves should suffice. B is not the correct answer either. You would not wear a mask and a gown when a resident coughs while you're feeding them. If the resident was coughing before you came in, and maybe if they had a fever, well, that may tell you that the person has an infectious process and we need to test their sputum to see if they need to be on isolation and if you need PPE. But that was a whole bunch of ifs and none of that was stated in that question. So if a person is coughing while you're feeding them, that is a sign of aspiration. That means the food is going you know, down into the lungs instead of into the stomach. So you would not have to wear PPE for a person who's aspirating. And one of the other videos, we talked to you about how to prevent aspiration. 
So you would do C because that is the most contaminating and that one actually follows the standard precaution guidelines. You'd wear gloves when removing a bedpan. 41, to help prevent residents falls, the nurse aide should a, because A has always, usually when I see a, a test question that gives the words always or never um, as an answer option, that tells me right then it's not the answer because um, in healthcare, we have to individualize patient care. So it can't be always, it can't be never. It's going to be based off of that individual. So I'm going to reread it and I'm going to continue. 41, to help prevent residents falls, the nurse aid should. A, always raise side rails when any resident is in his or her bed. Well, sometimes, especially if you're taking care of residents in like an ALF assisted living facility, they may not even have side rails. So again, that one, I automatically know that's not the right answer. B, leave the resident's bed at the lowest level when care is complete. Hmm, that one sounds almost correct. C, encourage residents to wear larger size, loose, fitting clothes. I have no idea how that's going to prevent a fall. D, remind residents who use call lights that they need to wait patiently for staff. They're not going to do it. <laughs> you just make sure you have the call light there for them and then you move faster. So the correct answer to 41 is B as in boy. 42, as the nurse aide begins his or her assignment, which of the following should the nurse aide do first? A, collect linen supplies for the shift. B, check all the nurse aides assigned residents. C, assist a resident that has called for assistance to get off of the toilet. D, start bathing a resident that has physical therapy in one hour. Before you, at the start of your shift, your priority needs to be the one person who called. If you have 14 patients, do not go check on the other 13 that have not called and ignore the one who's sitting on the toilet. So the best answer for this one, patient safety, is going to be C. After you assist the patient, then you can go back and collect your supplies and then go and, you know, start um, checking on all of your other residents. 43, which of the phone would affect the nurse aide status on the state's nurse aid registry and also cause a nurse aid to be ineligible to work in a nursing home has to be something really bad. So let's see what the options are. A, having been terminated from another facility for repeated tardiness. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna report you to the state for being late. B, missing a mandatory infection control in-service training program. I'm still not gonna report you to the state. C, failing to show for work without calling to report the absence. Not enough to report you to the state. D, having a finding for resident neglect. Again, so D is the answer. And as I stated before, we are mandatory reporters. So yes, you will be reported to the state and depend on the severity, also the police. So make sure you're taking care of your patients. 44, to help prevent the spread of germs between patients, nurse aide should A, wear germs when, I'm sorry, wear gloves, excuse me, when touching residents. C, hold supplies and linens away from their uniforms. C, wash hands for at least two minutes after resident contact. D, warn residents that holding hands spreads germs. So the way that you're going to prevent contact of germs or spread of germs between patients is you're going to have to do B. You cannot allow your um, supplies or towels or linens to touch your uniform. If you do, and let's say one person has C. diff, when you go into the next room, you're going to be spreading that bacteria that can cause um, the next patient to have a very foul diarrhea, foul smelling, and they can become dehydrated. So you don't want anything touching your uniform. The answer is not A because let's say that the patient's not on isolation and you have to go and take their pulse. Well, you're not gonna wear gloves <laughs> whenever you're taking someone's pulse. So it did not give, A did not give enough information. You don't wear gloves when touching every resident. You wear gloves when touching the residents that require you to glove. And also the answer is not C, because for the state of Florida, you do not wash your hands for two minutes. However, you do provide 20 seconds of friction. 
15, a sink has hand control faucets. The nurse aide should. A, use a paper towel to turn the water on. B, use a paper towel to turn the water off. C, an elbow if possible to turn the faucet controls on and off. D, bare hands to turn the faucet controls both on and off. Well, technically, dirty hands can touch a dirty sink. I have rarely ever seen a faucet that allow elbow controls because that may not be uh, appropriate for those who have a disability. <laughs> it needs to be something that can be you know, readily accessible. The best answer is going to be B. So dirty hands can touch a dirty sink. However, once your hands are clean, you don't wanna recontaminate them. So you're gonna use a paper towel to turn the water off and if also to open up the door if necessary. So you can exit the bathroom. 46, when moving a resident up in bed who is able to move with assistance, the nurse aide should. Position self with knees straight and bent at waist. B, use a gate or transfer belt to assist with reposi repositioning. C, pull the resident up holding on to one side of the draw sheet at a time. D, bend the resident's knees and ask the resident to push with his or her feet. So let's go back to the statement. This resident can help. So if they can help, um, you want to allow them to assist you. So the best answer is going to be D as in dog. You're gonna have the patient bend their knees, push up in bed, bend their knees, push up in bed until hopefully they get back to the top of the bed. 47, the resident's weight is obtained routinely as a way to check the resident's A, growth and development, B, adjustment to the facility, C, nutrition and health, D, activity. Why do we weigh our residents? And yes, the answer is C, nutrition and health. Um, at this point is, you know, for our, our state of Florida examination is geared towards the, um, the adult population. So they should have already met all of their growth and development stages. Um, checking the weight does not have anything to do with their adjustment to the facility. C, nutrition and health, because if they're losing weight, they could be depressed. Um, you know, maybe they already had a history of, you know, malnourishment. So we want to make sure that they're not losing weight, that they're maintaining their weight and or, you know, gaining weight if, if that's what's applicable or needed while they're in your care. Um, let's say it's somebody who, um, who has congestive heart failure. Okay, so the heart is failing. It's not pumping or circulating the blood and nor the fluids. So that means usually your resident's legs will get extremely edematous or they're going to have these, these crackling um, breath sounds and they're going to be short of breath. So that's when your doctors would normally prescribe a fluid restriction. We have to weigh um, our patients who have congestive heart failure daily because if they gain more than three pounds within a short time frame, the doctor's going to change their medications. Um, more than likely, they're going to change their diuretics. When they change the diuretics, that means that patient's going to be using the bathroom a lot to pull off those excess fluids. 48, which of the following is a, is a right that is included in the resident's bill of rights? A, to have staff available that speak speak different languages on each shift, B, to have payment plan options that are based on financial need, C, to have religious services offered at the facility daily, D, to make decisions and participate in own care. The answer is D. All right. And so if you need more information on the Residence Bill of Rights and you attended the class at Florida Training Academy, you can just access our Google resource page and you'll see a whole bunch of information. But everything else is pretty much optional. It'd be really hard to get a clergy person to come to the, the, um, the hospital every day unless it's that patient's personal, you know, clergy man or woman. Um, the hospital doesn't necessarily have to have financial aid, however, some of them do. And then um, it's going to be nearly impossible to have, you know, staff that speak every language. Some of your facilities will have paid translators. You will call a toll-free number, and then that paid translator, you let them know what language the, the, the patient or resident speaks, and then the paid translator will translate. 49, which of the following, if observed as a sudden change in the resident, is considered a possible warning sign of a stroke? A, dementia, B, contractures, C, slurred speech, D, irregular heartbeat. All right, dementia is usually not a sudden change, so it would not be dementia. Contractures we talked about earlier, that's when the joint gets fixated, and that's usually due to a lack of range of motion or improper positioning. 
C, slurred speech is the correct answer. D, irregular heartbeat is not something that you would be able to see as a sudden change. Um, again, this test is geared towards CNAs. So that would be something that your nurse could detect with a, you know, EKG or with some type of telemetry monitoring. But again, this test is just a basic test. So if you notice that your patient has slurred speech, who never had slurred speech before, you want to think fast, and fast is an acronym um, to help you um, to help you quickly assess someone to see if they're having a stroke. The F stands for face. You want to look at their face. You want to look for symmetry. Um, if the face is drooping on one side, that is a sign that the patient could be having a stroke. A, you're going to ask the residents to raise their arms. One arm may not raise as high as the other. If that is happening, that is a sign of a stroke. And then S, ask your resident to speak. Um, usually speech is going to be slurred if they're, you know, possibly having a, a stroke. So you can ask them to say their name. It may come out very garbled, hard for you to understand. The T stands for time to call a code if you're in a hospital. If you're in a home setting, it's time to call 911. So I'm going to repeat that. Stroke assessment really quick for CNAs and also basic medical staff is F, face. A, arms, S, speech, T, time to call, time to call for some help. 50 is a little more complicated because it did not label any of the vital signs. It's expecting you to know the ranges of the vital signs so that you would um, select the right one. 50 states, considering the resident's activity, which of the following sets of vital signs should be reported to the charge nurse immediately? And then we have vital signs for the resting, um, vital signs after eating, vital signs after walking activity, and then vital signs while watching TV. When well, anytime a resident does something extraneous, we expect for their vital signs, especially their heart rate and their blood pressure to increase. When we look at the numbers here, none of these are blood pressures. Blood pressures usually have a slash separating the systolic from the diastolic. There are no slashes here. It's just dashes. So I didn't write the test. <laughs> I'm just explaining it to you. So none of the numbers here are blood pressures. What are the numbers? Column by column, row to row. What are the numbers? Um, the first column going down 98.6 with a circle behind it. That circle stands for degree. So the first column going down is temperature. We already stated that there were no vital signs shown here. I'm sorry, no um, no blood pressure so shown here. So that 98 slash 32, that is not a blood pressure. The center column would be the pulse or heart rate, and then the last column would be respirations. So we have temperature, we have pulse, and we have respirations. The correct answer, the one that you need to report to the charge nurse immediately is going to be A. The temperature is normal. Okay, so elderly people, they did not give us the resident's age, but normally a temperature from, you know, 98 to 99s, we're okay with that. That's not anything you're going to report to the, the doctor right away. Um, with B, the temperature is 97, but it's 97 after the person ate something. The person could have had something cold that altered their temperature. You'd have to wait about 10 to 15 minutes, go back and recheck. And if it's still 97, then yes, go let your nurse know. But that's not a reason to let the nurse know immediately. Temperature is 97 after eating. Just think about, you know, what did my patient have that could have um, altered their temperature? So going back to A again, because I'm still leaning towards A. A, we talked about the temperature being 98.6. That's normal. That's nothing to report. But look at the heart rate. The heart rate is 98. Our normal heart rate for adults would be 60 to 100. So even though the heart rate is normal, it's still on the higher end. So we do want to monitor that. Let's continue. Let's go to the respirations. Your normal respiration rate is 12 to 20. And for question number 50A, the respiration rate is 32. That means your patient is hyperventilating. They are not getting enough oxygen, even though the O2 saturations weren't shown. A person should not be breathing that fast while they're at rest. So A is the person or the patient whose vital signs you would want to report to the charge nurse right away. All right, so I hope that helped you. I know it you know, took maybe an hour to go through all 50 questions. I need you to keep practicing questions until the time that you take your test. 
If you're one of our students at Florida Training Academy, our Google resource page um, does have multiple practice tests. We don't know the exact questions that are on the Florida um, state, of, state of Florida CNA examination, but what we do know is that our students rarely fail. So we want you to keep practicing. Again, my name is your Nurse Eunice. If you um, need me, my um, website is www. Dot fl is in Florida training.com. Just click on the contact us page or tab and um, just shoot us an email. I look forward to working with you all. I wish you much success. Bye to my future nurses. Have a blessed day.